Apologies, we have experienced previously that the moderators get kicked out uh, sometimes of the room. I'll try one more time and then um, give a brief introduction to, uh, to the quantum education efforts that we have been doing so far. And I'll do this uh, without the slides now to be sure. So um, as many of you, I'm sure, have, uh, have heard about in various different uh, circumstances within the last couple of years, there has been the efforts to assemble the quantum education community uh, around Europe, uh, the quantum um, quantum technology uh, uh, CSA, QT Edu, has been assembled to do this. And uh, we have then launched both community activities in the form of working groups. We have uh, launched a um, set of repositories. There's a competence framework that, uh, that we are uh, hoping we will become the standard of how to talk about skills and competences within the quantum technology arena. And then we have the uh, pilot programs that have been launched. 11 of these have been, and been launched and uh, we will hear from three of them today. So without further ado, uh, I want to give, pass on the, the word to um, Professor Lewandowski. So Heather Lewandowski from Boulder in Colorado. Uh, has been working foundational uh, contributions to, to the field of physics education research. I have had the pleasure of working together with you, and, and but also very recently have been contributing very much to the uh, mapping out of the workforce uh, requirements. And this will be the topic of the presentation today. I will always give a minute introductions when there's one minute left, and otherwise the word is yours. Go ahead. Thank you, Jakob. Let me just share my screen here. Great, so today I'd like to talk to you about uh, sort of the idea of preparing for the quantum revolution, right? So we have to sort of think about the workforce going forward and what is the role of higher education? And so this is going to be pulled from two uh, different studies, one done at the University of Colorado and one done through the Quantum Economic Development Consortium uh, Workforce Task Force. And I'll tell you a little bit more about those later. Uh, a lot of uh, references and papers can be found at this QR code or through these two papers. So generally, the, the general questions that I'd like to answer today, really to start off with, is what is going on in the U.S. respect to quantum? Um, since this is mostly a, a European audience, just want to give a brief overview so we can sort of put that into context. Also, then digging into the sort of quantum workforce. So what are the jobs and what are the opportunities in the quantum industry currently and looking forward over the next five years? And what are the skills and knowledge that are needed for these jobs? as uh, sort of denoted by folks in the quantum industry. And finally, what sort of degrees uh, can help students prepare for working in this? And ultimately some recommendations for both higher ed and also for students and postdocs looking to enter this. So in December of 2018, uh, the US passed the National Quantum Initiative Act and that sort of kickstarted a, a lot of activity in the US. It was the like most bipartisan uh, sort of act that I've ever seen recently. So in the House, it passed 348 to 11, which is uh, remarkable for US politics. So it's an overwhelmingly positive and uh, sort of unifying idea in the US. And one particular point, if you look at this act, if you look at the purposes, this point down here, it says to expand the number of researchers, educators, and students with training in the quantum information science and technology to develop a workforce pipeline. And so this was really forefront within this act. Uh, and so this is something that we've really uh, thought deeply about and engaged industry on. So to help the science and the workforce, we developed this something, uh, the US developed something called the National Quantum Coordination Center. And through that, they're coordinating a lot of efforts. All of them have a core piece of education and workforce development. So one thing I meant to mention, the QEDC, this Quantum Economic Development Consortium, which is a group of stakeholders from industry, uh, national labs, and higher education, really uh, working towards developing quantum, uh, primarily in the US, but it is actually starting to expand into Europe now. We have the National K-12 Education Partnership working at sort of up through the high school level uh, to get quantum awareness uh, to students. 
And then there are a lot of research institutes, all which have education and workforce uh, components of them. So the National Science Foundation developed quantum leap challenge institutes. In fact, the University of Colorado is uh, home to one of these. So these are large multidisciplinary, multi-university institutes. And uh, similarly, the Department of Energy also developed national quantum information research centers, and there are five of those across the nation. So there's a tremendous amount of funding and activity going on in the science and the workforce development across the US. So that's just kind of a backdrop uh, because all of the, the studies that we've done uh, have been uh, US centric. So thinking now about these questions, you know, what are the jobs, skills, and degrees needed to really succeed uh, in the quantum industry? So these come from two different studies of the quantum workforce. The first was done uh, centered at the University of Colorado and Rochester Institute of Technology. These are 21 uh, interviews with folks in the quantum industry. So we have like 30 hours of interviews talking with them about their needs. And then the second one was through QEDC, which is a quantitative survey uh, where 56 companies responded to multiple choice questions about their needs, both currently and in the future. And so all of the data come from these two studies. So we started digging into these questions. The first is, you know, what are the jobs currently, right, in 2021? And what are the distribution of jobs predicted to be within the next, say, five years? I, I don't think anybody can predict really beyond that. So if we look at uh, the percent of the 21 companies that we interviewed and what are the types of jobs that they have currently, uh, you know, so there's five key technical uh, jobs. So engineer, experimental scientist, theorist, technician, application. There's most companies have somebody uh, called something of an engineer. So digging into a little bit about those data, you can see uh, they're predominantly electrical engineers, but also software mechanical. One thing to note, there's not something here called quantum engineer, and I'll come back to that in a moment. If we look to the future, what are, what are the range of jobs that we expect? So these are all the different job titles uh, that the 56 companies uh, sort of identified and where they're going to be hiring in the next two years. So this bottom bar orange uh, versus three to five years blue. And so one thing to notice, kind of the orange and blue bars are about the same. What this tells us is the distribution of jobs uh, is not likely to change. It's not that all of a sudden we, we, we're only going to need software developers um, or something like this. Uh, so the distribution is about the same, which also means educational programs don't have to rapidly change um, over the next few years. This does not mean that most jobs are going to be experimental physicists. This is the number of companies, not the number of jobs. So be careful when taking a look at this. So this gives us some hope that, you know, as we're developing educational programs, we're not going to have to pivot rapidly over the next few years. So thinking about sort of what skills are needed and how many of those skills are sort of classical skills, if you will, or non-quantum versus quantum. And so if you look at the common skills across all quantum jobs, when we asked folks in the interview, almost all companies said, well, we want people with coding and uh, data analysis skills. And remember, this is classical coding. This is not, uh, you know, coding on a quantum computer. Laboratory experience, electronics, you see a sort of a common thread here. These are mostly non-quantum skills uh, and actually very transferable to other jobs. Um, and so a lot of hands-on skills here exist as well. So these are generally the, the common skills, but of course you want to sort of dig in and think of what are the consensus skills for specific jobs, right? You can't, the quantum industry is very diverse in ter terms of the types of jobs. So if we think of what is a consensus skill, that means at least 50% of the company said that is, a that is a skill that we need for this job. So we say that's a consensus, at least 50%. And so if we look at all the different jobs we have here on, on the vertical axis here from, you know, data scientists down to error correction, and this is the number of skills that they say uh, that are, are consensus that these folks need. So there's a wide range of sort of number, right? So if you're error correction scientist, right, or application solutions architect, they need a lot of, of skills, uh, of primary skills versus data scientists only need one. I think what's also very interesting from this um, and something I really want to point I want to drive home, the orange bars are non-quantum skills, the blue are quantum. So it's not that this is just a completely blue graph. 
a lot of these jobs really need these non-quantum skills. And so we have to make sure that we're preparing uh, students uh, in both areas and don't sort of over-target the quantum skills, if you will. All right, so uh, question three is, are there well-defined categories of jobs, right? So do it, does everybody have to have a broad, you know, what kind of skills and what kind of degree programs are we creating? So if we look at the correlation of skills and knowledge, so the skills and knowledge here are, are, are duplicated on the X and Y axis, you know, error correction, applications design, device physics control theory. Uh, and we look at the correlation between these skills uh, from our respondents. So red is positive correlation, blue is negative. You kind of see this thing as sort of block diagonal, where uh, there are three main sort of groupings here. And if you kind of dig into what these skills really are, it actually falls out quite nicely. So if you look at the skills all required, which are correlated with one another, these are all sort of hardware skills, mechanical assembly, digital circuit design, device physics, noise measurement. These are all sort of correlated with one another and anti-correlated with the other skills. And you can see other components here. Uh, this is really a, what I call a business component, business development, sales, and marketing. And then finally, more of a software track, if you will. Uh, theoretical math, applications design, uh, DevOps, that sort of thing. So the nice thing is there are three sort of main uh, sort of pathways in, and students don't need to know all of the, the skills, but think about the correlation within each of these kinds of uh, sort of jobs. Okay, so finally, what degrees are needed for the different jobs, right? Do we, do we all need PhDs in physics? Uh, no. So once again, these are all the different jobs uh, that folks had sort of defined here, and the colors represent what fraction of think of degree levels they expect to hire. So bachelor's here, master's here in red, and then PhD up here uh, in green. And so it varies wildly by the type of job. So if you want to be an error correction scientist, you basically have to have a PhD, right? But there's a lot of room for uh, bachelor's and master's levels across uh, some of the different uh, positions. You know, circuit designer, you know, maybe 30% uh, up to 40% circuit designer are our bachelor's degrees. So thinking about this uh, is not just you need a PhD, but for certain jobs, it is uh, sort of more desired. So I think that's interesting. So from all of these and, and other data, what are sort of recommendations to think about? So what new training is needed? What we heard generally from companies is they're satisfied with the skills and knowledge of physics PhD graduates. You don't have to mess with that. These folks are, are jumping into these jobs that are well-trained and everything is, is quite good with this. They also really value hands-on experience. Uh, that came up again and again throughout all these interviews. Thinking about what new training is needed for undergraduate engineers. What we're hearing is a basic course in quantum information, right? So we don't have to have undergraduate engineers take an entire like second degree in, in quantum information science you know, for a software track, you know, uh, maybe a one to two semester long uh, course in, in things like algorithms or hardware device physics qubits. So there's this uh, idea that you can take a few courses um, and same, same for the hardware track and, and be uh, really well trained to enter the quantum industry. Folks want really good engineers that are able to speak a little quantum. They don't want, you know, necessarily have to have an entire degree or master's or PhD in, in quantum information. For physics students and postdocs, um, one of the things is what are they missing, right, uh, that engineers do have? One is working collaboratively on software. Uh, a lot of folks said, please don't program like a physicist. Uh, and so collaborative coding, version control, things like that, I think are easy to in integrate into the curriculum, as well as engineering and system design skills. So thinking about recommendations for students and postdocs, uh, you know, the US quantum industry, right, in general, it, it's growing and, and that's across, across Europe as well. There are a variety of future positions available and not all require very specialized quantum knowledge and degrees. Some do, but not all. So what, what are some recommendations? One, hands-on experience is desired. This is a critical. Uh, make sure and students get at that through internships, research experiences, formal courses are also useful for many job roles. 
not all working in quantum information and science and technology need a PhD in quantum physics, right? I think this, we need to break this idea down, right? Consider becoming quantum aware by taking uh, one to three courses in, in QIST, right? Conversational in quantum. Uh, you're not going to be developing new algorithms, uh, but you can really be working on the hardware. Uh, still focus on traditional STEM skills, right? All, most of these companies, a lot of what they talked about were these uh, skills that are transferable to other, other industries, which is exciting because it doesn't uh, have students sort of very narrowly defined within one industry. They can go into different industries that, you know, interest them. And finally, uh, trying to break down this idea of don't worry about trying to become a quantum engineer. This is not a well-defined role. We asked like 26 people for their different definition of quantum engineer, and we pretty much got 26 different definitions, right? So don't worry about that. Uh, and don't worry about applying to jobs uh, based on the job title. Look at the skills and not the titles. I think that's, that's a general uh, good suggestion. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Heather. Thank you. Uh, I was just about to give you a one minute warning. Um, which is a fantastic thing because it means that we will have a chance to have a, a, a quick question uh, from Rainer uh, who asks, uh, were the job types and their designations given by you or did they emerge from the answers of the participants? So the, the columns that you had where you showed those. So for uh, the ones for the survey, they were uh, taken, we looked at 400 uh, different job uh, ads uh, uh, across in the fall of 2020, and we basically got those job titles from those job ads um, for that. For the, the quality of the interview study, those were emergent from what the, the folks said. Okay, thank you very much. So I, I have a lot of questions, and I'm sure that other people also have a lot of questions. We'll move on, and then, uh, and then we will take it in the discussion session. So thank you very much, Heather. And, uh, and, and we will follow up on this um, at, the, at the end. Now, I welcome Franziska Greinert uh, who, uh, from TU Braunschweig, who will be talking about her work with the competence framework. Uh, thank you, Jacob. And, oh, yes. Yeah, I would like to report on our Delphi study, in which we conducted predictions, assessments, comments, and more about the future quantum workforce, and in particular input for our competence framework. Yeah, and I want to motivate our study with two statements from our last survey. Um, the relevance of QT for industry will increase significantly in the near future, and special educational programs fitted to our rising needs are necessary. Yeah, we asked our participants to rate their agreement with more than 30 statements, that we had expected from previous questionnaires. And these were the two with the highest agreement. And uh, that's, that's not really surprising. It's more nice to have, that we now have empirical data from the community to confirm this. But what is in this special educational programs? What are the specific needs? And yeah, identifying these was the main objective of our study. And we decided for a Delphi study, an iterative series of questionnaires, each based on the results of the previous one, because it's a common method to collect expert opinions from a broad community. And for such a complex topic where a single survey would be enough, not enough, we've heard from our pilots that several of them also decided for the Delphi method to collect in community input. Yeah. And we started with a smaller pilot round in March 2020 to get an overview of this new emerging field and with asking most of the questions on an open format. Building on this, we ran our first main round in autumn 2020. Here we had more than twice as many participants and more pre-structured and ranking questions. Finally, our second main round with many closed questions to place in spring with more than 90 people participating. And we are really happy about this increasing number of participants. We interpret it as a sign of, of the relevance of the topic and the interest of the community and also the great networking efforts. Yeah. And before talking about some results, I would like to take a brief look at the participants as we ask them for some background information, including what profession, 
the area they have cover. And in the pilot round, we've, we've seen they, it was heavily dominated by people from science and in education. And they also found the largest group in the two main rounds. But there was a clear shift towards industry and computer science between the pilot and the main rounds. And for which we also thank the quick network as they shared the questionnaires and got in people from industry. Yeah. And we asked them in which country they work in. And yeah, the most were from these 25 European countries. And yeah, we see a focus on the Western European countries dominated by people from Germany. But if we compare this to the much larger QTHU community, we, we see a quite similar picture. Yeah. Okay, that should be enough on the study design of the participants for today. Have a look at our main goal in QTHU, that was the development of a competence framework, kind of map with all the topics that will be important for the future quantum workforce. And as Jacob said, we, we hope that it becomes a standard for talking about quantum technologies. Yeah, our framework is based on, but not only on, results from the Delphi study. We also had other input. And as a template, we use DecompEdu, the digital competence framework for educators. Yeah, and before going into some selected findings from our study, some predictions for the future quantum workforce, I will outline the development of the framework. We started in the pilot round with some open-ended questions and sorting these answers resulted in this map of important aspects for educating the future quantum workforce. We gave this as an input for the first main round in an, a pre-structured question. Uh, the participants were asked to focus on a specific subfield of quantum technologies and fill in such a table with a concrete competence, what it is useful for, and what level of expertise is needed, distinguished between users and developers. And we gave this example. The understanding of qubit operations is useful for composing quantum algorithms, and users need a deeper basic knowledge of the qubit concept and the effects of different operators should operate towards on a formal logical level. From this, we received 180 answers for 55 subfields and analyzed them with a categorization. This categorization was a starting point for Reiner and me to develop the framework. With an iterative sorting of digital sticky notes, we came up to, to the order of the mentioned aspects and added what we felt was missing and yeah, used the structure inspired by Dikump Edu. And yeah, got this beta version in December 2020. We presented the beta version to the community and asked them for feedback and for volunteers for expert interviews. And with around 30 participants in the interviews, we came up with some restructuring and additions for version one. And that then got a professional appearance with a graphical update. And now it looks like this. Yeah, this is the overview page with a theoretical background at the top uh, with, with the concepts of quantum physics and the physical foundations of quantum technologies and the practical background in the lower right corner with the practical and soft skills, including practical and experimental skills or classical programming, and also management, networking, teaching, and centrally the application areas, the, the concrete co technologies beginning with enabling technologies, the hardware for computers and sensors, quantum computing and simulation, quantum sensors and metrology, and also quantum communication. For each area, we have a dedicated details page, which can be found in the firmware PDF, available for download on our project website or directly via this QR code. Yeah, then we published together with the European Commission the methodology and version history, where you can also find more information about the DEFI study and the development of the framework. Currently, we are working on qualification profiles. There are examples of the scope of quantum 
technology competences an individual has acquired so education or further training in preparation for employment and industry. We expect to publish some, first, some sample profiles in early 2022, but I already want to show you how they are designed and what this, this is preliminary example. We have a selection of items from the framework together with a proficiency level. These levels indicate how deep the competence or knowledge should be in a specific area. We follow the language levels for languages with keywords from DCOMPEDU, from A1 awareness to C2 innovation. And we still need to define this appropriate DPROQT in each of our framework areas. We still use this for, for an impression. Yeah. And some of these profiles might be achieved through a specific study program. For example, a combination of electrical engineering, or computer science or similar together with quantum technologies, only quantum computing or so. So these profiles could be used as a starting point for, for developing certification schemes, but also for planning study programs. And as well, so, the framework can be used to map and compare study programs. Yeah, that's our next steps, the qualification profiles and level definitions. And as the framework is intended to be a living document, we invite you to give, you, give us feedback at any time. And um, yeah, we plan annual updates for the framework and yeah, want to keep it updated to the current developments in quantum technologies. Okay, let's move on to the predictions. And the first main round, we asked our participants to estimate the industrial importance for the major QT areas in the short term of five to 10 years and in the long term. The statistical results are shown in this diverging stack bar chart. Um, yeah, our bars are normalized to 100% and aligned with the middle of the scale. So our ratings on the import, unimportant side on the left, while ratings on the important side of a six point scale are on the right. And yeah, we see a big shift in the expected importance of quantum computing and quantum simulation. But for all technology areas, we already expect industry relevance in the short term and even more in the long term. That's why we need to think about higher education and workers training now. Yeah, based on these results from the pilot and the first main world, these statistics, comments, and so on, we extracted more than 30 statements. These are used in the second main world to assess agreement. For example, we stated, in the long term, quantum computing will be the most important quantum technology. Or the same for communication, or similar. What we can say from the results is that we cannot say what will be the most important quantum technology. But there are much clearer results on education and the future quantum workforce. The statement was the highest agreement from all. 1.59 on a scale from one total agreement to six total disagreement was the one about the significantly increasing relevance in the industry, which I already showed in the beginning. This alone may be enough to justify the educational efforts and industrial training. But some other interesting statements also received very high agreement. The community sees a clearly need for special educational programs, and it will be essential to create networks between research and industry. So I'm very happy to see that there are already many efforts like the QTHU pilots and many working groups on QTHU and others. And we have heard today what amazing things are going on in the pilots. We'll hear even more tomorrow. And they focus not only on industry training or higher education, but also on outreach, on including the society. That's another topic that came up in the study. And it's also expected that the importance of quantum technologies for society will increase significantly. In this context, I would like to show you two statements based on comments uh, on the, in the first uh, uh, <laughs> on the first study rounds from the pilot and, and the, the first main round, we, we collected comments and formulated this, these statements for the assessment in the second main round. Yeah. It is necessary to 
will be necessary to transform second gen QT from a research sub subject to a subject of everyday life. Yeah, as the percent of the participants are meant to agree, that's not surprising. But communicating about this transformation, meaning outreach, has gained even higher agreement. 22 out of 62 rated communicate about it item higher than the need to transform itself. And only half as many participants rated the other way around. This clearly shows how important this is to involve society, for instance, through outreach activities. Yeah. I would like to show you three more statements as we asked if the participants agree that second gen QT will contribute to solve everyday problems. And yeah, it gained something between agreement and further agreement and around 80% on the agreement side. Yeah, it would be nice if, if it applies, but yeah, okay. And they will contribute to solve social, social challenges with further agreement, only 60% on the agreement side, but yeah, it's okay. Um, but if you have a look at this last statement, that they will lead to social inequality, we only see a very slight disagreement. I mean, and more than 40% agreed with the statement. That is alarming. And we need to keep that in mind. And this also could be a good starting point for the research in this direction. You have one minute. Yeah. Um, as a recap, yeah, I have presented our DEFI study, the development of a competence framework based on some study data and a smart selection of other results from the study. It is not clear what will be the most important quantum technology, but we see a clear need for special educational programs and outreach efforts. And we have to consider social challenges. Yeah, there will be more in a, uh, in a paper soon, but for now I would like to show you these materials if you are interested in more information. You can see again the link to the project website where the competence framework can be downloaded and the link to the methodology and version history. We also have an entry on the digital skills and jobs platform. And as I said before, the framework is intended to be a living document with annual updates. So I appreciate any feedback you may have. You can also contact me for more information about the study. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Francisca. Um, I want to just ask a very brief methodological question uh, around the uh, preference or the prediction questions that you posed. Mm -hmm. um, you are you are attributing a so um, a higher, let's say, significance of of the ones that have one or 1.5 or the ones that have two. Um, can you comment a little bit on, they are not really direct comparisons where people are going to predict, is this more important than that? So that means that it's fairly free for all to say, yes, quantum technology will be more, industry will be more significant. Um, it, it, would it be stronger somehow to, to, to ask for comparisons uh, between two different uh, statements and say which one would be more uh, valid or which one would be more likely to occur. And my question is whether in each of the categories there is a cultural question of societal interpretation of societal impact or impact of quantum technologies that is interpreted a little bit differently so that you give it a one in one case and a two in the other case. And, and the question were which conclusions we can draw from that. That was a long question, but just yeah. the methodology of, of asking um, those questions of, of opinions of futures. Yeah, we, we had this, uh, for, for, for this, we had a, a, a rating. So, so it could, could all, uh, each entry could be rated from one total important to total unimportant and based on this and all the comments we got, we, we had the statements. Mm -hmm. And always for each statement, uh, separately we ask for agreement. So uh, yeah, that, that was not compared to others, but we, mm -hmm. we also so had uh, statements um, yeah, 
around a similar topic, uh, asking from two different sides to, to compare that. Okay, thank you very much, Francisca. Um, and uh, now we'll move along to our triple header of having three different pilot presentations. We will start with uh, Alexandru Parla, who will be describing the progress on the pilot for minor slash bachelor higher education studies. So Alexandru, go ahead. Hello, yes, do you see my screen? We see your screen, but it's not in presentation mode. Yes, and now it should be in its presentation mode. Is it in presentation? Correct. Yes. Very good. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So thank you for inviting me. I'm Alexandru. I'm assistant prof at uh, Alto University, and I will talk about the pilot, uh, the minor pilot that has a kind of long name introducing quantum technologies, a modular set of action. So, um, the description of the minor is rather straightforward. Uh, we try to take modules in the sense of interdisciplinary parallel actions covering the four pillars of uh, quantum technologies. And, um, you know, like, like communication, computation, simulation, and metrology. But then uh, the question that arose, what is, uh, what is a minor? So we treat this computer science, physics, uh, and pedagogical aspects uh, at the bachelor level but also as a subset of master level education. And now considering the entire um, um, change in, in the methodologies, we also, uh, in our minor, we take this approach towards online learning and how can we uh, make these modules compatible, um, uh, compatible with, with Zoom or whatever big blue button and um, and how can we teach these, these, these materials in a setting where the students are far away or remote in front of a computer. So overall, we kind of try to assist the partners with the creation of, um, of a learning ecosystem. Um, and we see also this, this connection, like very bright bachelor students have to be attracted towards uh, quantum technology, uh, high school students have to be attracted towards quantum technologies. So that's why we inform this and we present in an easy, uh, we are not doing necessarily outreach, but we present scientific results in an easy to grasp uh, way such that um, we, 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 um, we enable this emergence of a quantum ready workforce. So I don't know, maybe in a five to 10 years uh, horizon. Overall, the, the goal is to have this quantum ready society, um, not necessarily with, um, with the best knowledge, I mean, with deep knowledge, but with the, with the knowledge that allows a positive attitude towards uh, quantum technologies. So I guess this is the, the short description of the minor. So, okay, let me see if I can, okay. So the participants are ranging from, um, from Italy to, to Netherlands, to, to Romania, to Denmark, uh, to the Czech Republic. Um, so as you can see, we have uh, quite a lot of people uh, involved in these things on the right to see the logos of the universities. But what's important is that we really try to, to mix this physics, computer science, and, and, and teach methodology, pedagogical uh, things in this minor, so to, to connect between, as I said, between high school and, uh, and master. Um, so this is the, the slide. So what has been happening until now, it's, uh, we kind of tried to have a synergy phase, more or less successful. Um, so um, our synergetic actions included guest lectures, include still guest lectures, where different uh, participants lecture in courses, but also in, um, in panels organized by, um, or for example, in panels organized by the um, professional societies uh, like IEEE. So we try to, to, to form projects, uh, for example, on quantum software. Uh, and there was this talk, uh, the, the first talk, which, which showed that actually the competencies between hardware and software are considered to be very disjoint. And we try to make actually software to be the binding element between uh, the physics and the, the quantum science and uh, the computer science and computer engineering aspects of this pilot. So um, we also plan to organize spring summer schools, workshops. Um, so let's see how this will pan out next year, uh, considering again the, the online teaching uh, that seems to be um, um, that seems to be the norm. Um, 
A first result that we can um, that we can report on is um, at the University of Insubria, uh, the like a specialization course in quantum technologies. Uh, it's designed to be delivered in English uh, between January and June 2022. And again, it will touch on these uh, four pillars of uh, quantum technologies, computing, but also uh, we, uh, because we kind of, uh, um, because it was recognized that uh, quantum chemistry could be one of the, uh, the, the first applications of uh, quantum computing. There's also uh, a, a focus on classical and quantum simulation of quantum systems. Um, overall, the, the, these, these two things will be supported by classical and quantum machine learning uh, courses and uh, an experimental course on quantum optics for quantum information. And in order to uh, to support the students, uh, they, they, they will have like very various um, uh, backgrounds. There will be extensive tutorials, um, practical hands-on tutorials uh, to allow them to, to apply the learned concepts. And moreover, we will we are uh, there will be like uh, introductory modules for uh, the mathematics. Uh, like linear algebra, quantum mechanics uh, formalism, but also um, it was mentioned in the previous uh, talk, like uh, do not uh, write software like a physicist. So that's why we will have an introduction to Python. And um, um, we will also go over security and network, like the basics principles, because if you are talking quantum computing and you are um, discussing its applications or challenges with respect to classical computing, you need to have some background in these uh, in these things. Um, another thing that we are uh, that, that that has been developed in in this minor um, the past uh, the past uh, months is like we tried to really adapt the online interactive teaching of, of a course we had and which is also uh, offered in the Insubria um, a special course. Um, and called Practical Quantum Computing, which is a course on the theory and practice necessary for using uh, noise intermediate scale devices as well as error corrected machines. And for this, we we are using um, Google CERC uh, and the, the, the materials provided by Google and also materials provided by Qiskit. In, in, uh, in, we are trying to be as um, as platform independent as possible and provide to the students um, a wide perspective on, 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 on the quantum software field. So the challenges of, of addressing this thing in, uh, in an interactive setting, uh, we, we ran some, uh, some feedback forms and um, actually the surprising element is that the students were happy with it uh, in, in being online. And surprisingly, also they they considered technology uh, to be the 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 thing that the, or the the element that could spice up and improve the quality of uh, overall. So we are looking actually into these things and uh, in, um, trying to 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 come up with a recipe that will be extended to the other modules in the pilot. Anyway, so another approach is to use um, quantum games. Um, and um, there was a summer school at the end of August and the 4th of September um, uh, in, in Romania uh, and uh, Quarks Interactive, one of the partners in this pilot, um, had like uh, for two weeks tried to, to present to high school students uh, 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 quantum, uh, quantum mechanics and its applications to quantum computing. And very interestingly, there were like 50% female students and out of these 50 participants, 42 responded to the feedback form. And it was interesting to see that uh, after two weeks, using simplified, uh, using the simplified methodology, um, the students that responded to the feedback were able to, ex to explain in one sentence uh, what superposition and entanglement is, and about 90% got it correct. So I don't know, 90% uh, out of 40. Um, they were able to uh, to to give examples of two entangled quantum states and uh, also talking about the applications of quantum computing they were able to imagine and describe in very short sentences in two or three sentences uh, a quantum computing uh, use case and um, really um, um, really nice applications were, were imagined. For example, 10% imagined medical applications. I don't know, like um, doing uh, CT scan uh, analysis or curing, I don't know, what kind of cancer. Um, 
one could see that they also addressed um, they were uh, they were envisioning applications to combinatorial optimization, uh, for example, playing chess or um, optimizing I don't know um, traveling salesmen, uh, traveling salesman problems. So um, we we consider this uh, um, kind of a success, and then we started also. Um, so I mean, uh, it's it's kind of becoming obvious that m machine learning will be an enabling technology in quantum te uh, in quantum computing and we are not necessarily talking about quantum machine learning but classical machine learning and we started drafting some um, together with TU Delft and uh, uh, uni uh, the Polytechnic University in Valencia and TU Klausthal and some other universities uh, we started discussing and um, drafting course materials for how these uh, classical machine learning methods can be used and applied um, in quantum computing. The hope being that once we prepare this... Uh, one okay. Yes, I'll be one minute ready. The, uh, the hope being that if we prepare bachelor students in, in an interdisciplinary manner, they will be able to use these this techniques, for example, for decoding error correction, for optimization, and uh, even quantum natural language processing. Um, the last thing that we are uh, that we did is uh, we tried to have a look and, uh, at how Alto uh, is uh, performing. Uh, it, it's it's analyzing its uh, teaching methods in a data-driven uh, way, such that students, once they uh, attend an online course or uh, whatever new course, they uh, they are satisfied and not burned out. So we are trying to get these things. Um, into our modules and 7%, 75% of the answers at Alto uh, uh, showed that uh, teaching is the, the way to, to improve uh, the quality of, um, of, of the studies. So um, future activities, it means we will uh, we'll try to implement all of the things that we showed on the last slide until May and then we'll, uh, until July, it's an evaluation phase and the, the long-term goal of this pilot, once finished, is to, to have a workforce that is capable or that will answer this question here in the last point. When will the first nature paper appear where the result was derived using a quantum computer, but the quantum computer has nothing to do with the result itself. So this miner should prepare the people uh, for working and solving this, uh, this challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alexandru. Um, we are uh, we are moving ahead to the to the next uh, next talk, um, uh, which is Martin Gärtner from Heidelberg University, uh, who will be presenting now the first of two masters pilots. All right, can you see my screen? Yes. That's great. So, thanks, Jacob, for the introduction. So I would like to present or introduce you to our open master pilot called EFFECT, which stands for Empowering the Future Experts in Quantum Science and Technology for Europe. And um, this pilot is coordinated by Shannon Whitlock from Strasbourg um, and myself. And uh, we're doing this together with a number of academic partners from Germany, France, and the Netherlands listed here. And, um, also um, a number of industry partners. So um, as the title uh, of this um, um, pilot says, it's the goal is to educate the future quantum workforce, right? Um, and prepare them for leadership roles. And um, so um, of course the students we are addressing are within their master programs and their local master programs. And so when we started um, thinking about this pilot, we, we um, asked ourselves where we could actually add value for the students um, to, their, um, to what they already have in their master programs. And we also asked the students and it turned out that many of them were interested in, um, you know, um, um, getting into topics that are not offered at their local institutions. So by, by offering shared courses, they would benefit. They were interested in mentoring and, and hands-on training from experts like on, on concrete, also technical stuff in their, maybe in their master thesis projects. And of course, many of them were interested in getting some in industry experience and seeing where, like what jobs in the quantum industry could look like 
and also establishing contacts uh, with industry. And of course, importantly also for them was to, to have opportunities for networking with their peers like across Europe and beyond their local institutions. So what we um, came up with was this um, idea of offering a master's certificate in quantum uh, science and technologies um, to select a fixed group of, of students to, uh, that participate in this program, uh, to have regular meetings with them, to have in-person events like workshops in schools, um, to have student organized events, right, to encourage students to also actually themselves contribute to the program and of course to motivate them by um, having this certificate as a goal at, at the end. So, um, so let me come in a little bit more detail to what this certificate entails. So we have four different modules. Um, first is the um, shared courses, which are courses that are taught in hybrid formats so that people from different institutions can participate. Then we have so-called quantum meetups, which uh, are monthly meetings with one expert in a specific topic who gives a talk and then um, followed by a discussion and questions by the students. We have um, in-person training events like um, workshops in schools. And um, we encourage people to do internships abroad, either in, in our academic partners, do a research internship or go to an industry partner. For an internship and we we set the minimal requirements to actually obtain this certificate to be um three out of these to take three um yeah courses within these modules where the internships count twice um so yeah so let me um tell you what has happened so far so um, we launched, uh, so like the implementation phase kind of started with the launch of our website in August. And then in September, we selected out of about 50, I think applicants, we selected 30 covering many different nationalities and also many different, um, you know, fields of studies. So their master programs are kind of diverse in condensed matter physics, material science, AMO, and also computer science. And then uh, beginning of October, we had a welcome meeting. So here you can see all the participants. Um, and then um, the effect courses started in October, um, where I want to highlight um, one course that I'm teaching together with Shannon Wigblock. This is like a collaborative teaching um, format that we're trying out. So we're developing this course as we go, right, and it uh, it's, consists of video lectures plus um, um, interactive sessions um, on Zoom, plus tutorials, exercises, and then discussions about them in the tutorials. Um, yeah, and this is like an introduction to quantum science and technologies, uh, which turns out to be not as easy since this is a really vast field. And yeah, we're noticing that it's, yeah, it's difficult to break this down and to do an interesting introduction. And the other three courses are courses that uh, where our partners have opened up their courses to external participants. Um, one from Karlsruhe um, by Alexei Ustinov and then two from Amsterdam um, by Florian Schreck and Robert Speu. And uh, yeah, now we have uh, 20, about 20 of our students are taking part in those courses and like there are several issues or difficulties we had to overcome, like first of all, matching the different semester times, right? Um, and also the accreditation of, um, accreditation of ETCS, ECTS points at the local institutions. We found now, you know, individual solutions for, for every institution through our local representatives. Now the first in-person event was the, so-called Quantum Ideas Factory, which was um, held in Heidelberg at the end of October. And there we had uh, 32 students. Most of them are effect students, but it was also open to external participants, also PhD students. And this was like an event where students got together and then for three days worked on a specific topic or challenge. 
which was posed by a mentor, a professor from one of our partner institutions, um, where you can see a list here, and then at the end they presented their results. And of course, one, one of the purposes of this meeting was also to, um, to socialize, like that students uh, get to know each other, which uh, I think went really well. We, we could see that students were super motivated working on their projects, and uh, they were super happy to come together again, like after all this uh, pandemic situation, to have an in-person event. Um, so that went really well, I think. Now, last week we um, um, released our internship offers on our website. So we have 28 internship offers from our academic partners and industry partners. And now we are in the process of matching, you know, the interests of students with, with these offers. Um, students can look through these and then um, informally apply for internships and we will we will then uh, help students with finding um, financing for these internships um, yes so going on um, to the future the next in-person event we are planning is the effect spring school which will take place in Strasbourg in um, in April next year so um, and this is open for not only for effect students, but also for external master and PhD students who are interested in QST topics. Um, it's organized, um, co-organized by very motivated students from Strasbourg and Heidelberg. Um, and it will have lectures on QST topics. It will have student presentations and poster sessions, as well as lab tours and cultural evening events. And if you want to know more, um, write us an email um at this email address here um okay so this already brings me to the end so of course this is an open pilot so if you find all of this interesting and you want to get involved um please contact us um, um we are still looking for um industry project offers or internship projects from industry partners we are still looking for speakers for our monthly um, quantum meetups. Um, um, we need. We are currently um, looking for lecturers for the spring school. Um, and um, if you are offering courses that are in hybrid format and you, that you can open up to external students, this is always very welcome, of course, um, um, to be included in our program. And yeah, in general, it's an open pilot. So if you're interested, feel free to reach out and um, get involved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, one quick question about the uh, administrative efforts in getting uh, ECTS mm -hmm. points. Uh, you said that this is handled through the local uh, representatives. Um, can yes. you say just a little bit more about uh, how this was done, how many ECTS and, and what, the, what the difficulties were and whether all of the students then got ECTS or only some of them. I mean, you know, this, uh, the, the lectures are still in progress, right? But so, um, in Stra like we have uh, very different solutions for all the different places. So in, in my case, it's very informal, right? Um, I just contacted our Dean of Studies and um, showed him a list of these courses and descriptions and he, he agreed that students will be simply accredited the ECTS points they would get at the partner institutions um, if they have uh, if they prove um, you know the successful um, participation if they if they have a, an exam or something um, where they can prove their success and in Strasbourg for example um, I think Shannon um, made it um, as a part of their graduate school there effect is like um, effect courses are being yeah, integrated into the into the program of their graduate school and in this way they can then bring in the uh, ECTS points and then the other other partners have other solutions right so this would actually be nice to have a, like a more generic procedure right to do this this is something we are still working on. 
does this mean that all of the courses that are being offered that you talked about are mm. formally approved in at least the partner uh, institution? They were not. They they were courses that have gone through all of the formalities to be approved as a normal course at, for instance, Heidelberg, where it was grounded. Um, or are they new courses that were invented for this? No, that have no, 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 no. So, procedure? so in the case of Shannon and my course, it is it's, it's a course that I'm offering in Heidelberg officially, right? It's yeah. part of the master in Heidelberg. And um, it, um, for the other courses, also, they are courses that um, people offer at our partner institutions. And then, for example, for me, if, if, if Heidelberg students take those courses, um, it's just like if they did a, um, a, an Erasmus or something, they just do courses abroad, right? Now online, but they just take exams there and then um, their, their credits get accredited in Heidelberg. Yes. Did that answer your question? Sorry, I'm not exactly. sure. Exactly. So yes, yes, it 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 did. So 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 that means that um, uh, uh, one way what what this pilot is showing is that for existing courses we can open them up to to synergies yeah. across Europe and we can maybe both uh, ease the load the workload but maybe also uh, bring out more synergetic courses and that would be a future vision that they are more and more of them are actually started from two sides maybe and and then they come yes. two courses uh, with one effort yes yes sounds sounds good okay thank you very much uh, martin and and now uh, we'll go on to the last of the three pilots which is aurel gabriz who will talk about the, the last master pilot before he does that i just want to reiterate again that everyone is welcome to write questions in the chat and, and please if you have a burning question from any of the previous talks then 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 please just Write it in the chat and then we can go through them uh, in the open discussion. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So okay, I managed to, un managed to unmute myself. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, let, um, let me welcome everyone to this last uh, presentation of. Um, of the pilot projects by the QT2 CSA. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the, we call it the quantum technology open master. And uh, we aim this to be a community project. And, um, and um, 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 it, we are doing this um, jointly with uh, several partners. In particular, I have listed here the, the people who are doing most of the work in the in the coordination team. And um, I'm also going to say, so why do I why why do I emphasize that this is a community project? We have 35 members from uh, from all over Europe, also including the the, the United States, and um, 14 countries are represented about from of these there are 27 universities, three research institutes, three industry representatives, and are also clusters. These categories are of course a bit flexible how to how to add them. So um, here you can see the logos that we that that of, of the participating institutions. So what is the aim of this community um, open master? So um, most of the methods and the and the problems we're encountering are actually very similar to what were mentioned previously. Um, I would say that this project lies in between the the minor project and the effect that we had seen last time, seen last time, um, because we are addressing the 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 masters quantum masters education ecosystem as a whole, not specifically for quantum science and technology experts but we are also looking at solutions, how to bring quantum to institutions where they are not present. So the, the, the challenges that we're facing is exactly how we ended at the last presentation. We need to find ways how to, how to recognize credit. Would they be CTS or micro-credential? Then uh, we also 
where we're also trying to explore in the pilot what are the institutional supplies, what is available at different institutions, what is at demand. And, um, and um, this is, um, was done during the planning and the energy phase. And now soon we're going to launch the actual actions. And then we would like to see the feedback from the students from, for, uh, for, all these, uh, for all these efforts. And the final aim is to, in some way, standardize cooperation between institutions and quantum technology education and create a network of, uh, of interconnection that would allow them to work together and, and complement whenever this is necessary. And um, we have um, defined the um, four major action lines. Of course, everything is affected by what we see here that the, we need to look at the, the accreditation and um, the solution that um, we were, we converged was, was similar or maybe identical to the previous one. So we have local representatives and uh, it's that has to take care of the administrative parts of the, of the, of the, the accreditation. And um, also an interesting direction that we would like to explore is how we can recognize micro-credentials using certificates on participation of, of a particular event. And, and uh, this would be centered around the, 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 the quantum technology competence framework, which uh, Francisca uh, presented during the second talk. So, uh, so these are the, the, the four action lines that uh, we're following. And um, I'm going to go into detail in, in, in all, all four of them. So in the first one, we're aiming at uh, exchange of courses. This could be bilateral or multilateral. The majority of the courses are going to start in the spring or the summer semester, depending on, 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 the, on the country where the, the institution is located. We have uh, so far collected 11 courses. These are offered from nine institutions. And the aim is to have, to complement the local available educational resources. The format is that the students would be attending remotely. They would receive their credits locally and the administrative duties always lie at the receiving end. So we're trying to make a low threshold entry in which people are able to offer their courses with a minimum overhead. Of course, this has to be done in a, in a hybrid format or online format, which is, uh, which, which might already be an effort, which is very appreciated for, for the purpose of this pilot. So we have, um, if you go onto the website, um, you will see all the collection. We mainly have quantum computing information and, and open quantum system, these kind of things. That we have. Um, then we're also organizing, collecting a set of guest lectures. The idea is again, the same to enhance classes, lectures that are available at a certain institution. The motto could be invite an expert. Okay, the, the, these lectures are two to three hours. They could be included as part of the course. And as you see, they are all categorized according to the competence framework topic. So anyone who's interested in a certain topic can, can, can easily identify these things. The website could be improved, but so far we have, as you see, nine, 16 contributions. So this, this structuring is, uh, is sufficient at the moment. We have uh, quite a number of different, uh, different uh, offerings. And, um, and, um, and, and I did not mention, but this is, we are also an open pilot. So it means we're looking for more people, institutions who would like to join. So we expect that this list of offered test lectures will grow over time. Then, um, we're also planning um, summer or po possibly summer remote, uh, possibly summer internships or projects. And we have already a collection and um, the, these projects may be either remote or in person, depending on the nature and the requirement from, uh, from, the, from the participants and also the availability of, of, of funding. In, in the pilot, we can only 
supply help to the students to 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 be able to receive funding we're not able to provide it so um we have various fields quantum computing simulations cryptography quantum or post and also quantum sensing and um lastly this is um, not affecting students directly we also have efforts going on for for joint development of, of uh, modules and teaching material and uh, these are the these are the two activities that are presently going on and the and the participants in the in the activities and um, finally i would like to mention that uh, we just closed the synergy phase so we're going to launch the the, pro the the programs in the summer and the spring semester so we're doing that in connection with a launch event where everyone is invited it's going to be on the 6th of december from from 16th central period time and um, here you see the the intended program and um, the registration is possible already on the website if you go there and uh, if you have any questions you can uh, contact simon who is doing bulk of the the work in the background to make this happen so he's, he's available at the at the email address qtom.pilot at utilia.eu so um thank you for your attention thank you thank you very much already for uh, also staying staying on time this means that we have uh, roughly 15 minutes now for for open questions um, to all of the talks and to also general discussions around the area of higher education and quantum technology so um i would like to just start with a a, a general question um methodological question again from for the first two talks um uh, so heather and Francisca, one of the problems um, when we try to survey uh, the future field and the interest in the field is that there are first movers in the field. Um, and so my question is, when you set up a study like this, how do you ensure that you don't come into a vicious cycle of first asking the first movers, which is not necessarily the same distribution as the end, uh, uh, industrial uh, ecosystem, and then we set in motion planning uh, educational initiatives based on what we learn in the beginning. And how do we ensure that we don't follow a trajectory that doesn't uh, so sort of accommodate for those changes? Do any of you want to comment on this? Uh, I'll just give a. Uh a comment uh, for our study with interviews, we were very careful to make sure that the uh, distribution of the types of companies that we got was broad in terms of folks that were, you know, sort of large companies, well-established names that you would know versus uh, sort of uh, maybe not main players, if you will, uh, in the quantum industry uh, to get this broad perspective from very small sort of startup companies. Uh, we got you know, ideas from different architectures. So, you know, we're, we're not all about just, you know, trapped ions or, or uh, you know, superconducting qubits. We had a, a broad range. I think your point is good. I mean, the uncertainty in the future is, is large, right? And so it's only a snapshot in time and we must continue to, to survey and understand this as we go forward and not just do this at one point in time and assume that that is static for the next, you know, 10 years. Because an associated question is, is there any knowledge about how fields like quantum technology might evolve as a first wave with very, very technical applications, but then as an ecosystem evolves, there are also going to be maybe new waves that are much, much less technical, much more service-based maybe, which will have completely different needs. And, and so the question is, it seems that much of this surveying is being done now coming from the physics education research or the physics side, um, what do you see as the balance between physics and, and maybe business school uh, impressions there? If you look to other industries as they're sort of emerging, this is a mm -hmm. common sort of trajectory where you have much more R&D um, and, and so the sort of jobs and things that are, are focused on, on that, as you get more towards products, 
uh, and the, the field matures, then you also get more towards engineers and you have to think about marketing and business and things like that. Um, we've got a little hint of that, but we're, we're sort of at the really beginning stages. Um, so I completely agree with you that we need to be careful that we, we don't look at this as, as the only thing, but we need to continue to go as the quantum industry evolves. And we don't know where exactly where it's going to go. So we have to continue to gather information. Um, and I think that's a really good point. And maybe one thing I would like to add is that we had a really interesting exchange with end users for quantum technologies, like from banks or um, yeah, with, with the, the Fraunhofer, Gesellschaft from Germany, they, they collected industry interested peop, uh, people, interested people from industry from the, the end user perspective. And uh, yeah, we, we asked what, what they think they need and, and what they expect from the people. And yeah, but, but the problem is they don't really know what they need. They, they, they say, yeah, we, we can be happy about everybody who's who's some expertise in, in quantum technologies, no matter what is, are the, the concrete topics they are focused in. Uh, yeah, we want somebody from quantum technologies. <laughs> and, and Siki is asking a, a, a question which is related to this, to the two of you. And it was related to this question that Heather said, or saying that don't worry about finding out what a quantum engineer is. And he's asking whether the, the attitude towards quantum engineers or wanting quantum engineers. All right, we lost Jacob, but uh, I, I will just say that it's not that they don't want engineers with quantum, it's just the title is just poorly defined. So companies do want right now, you know, electrical engineers who uh, have some quantum knowledge. So I think they do want that now and will go for it. It's just this title I think has been taken over and is so ill-defined that it does harm in terms of like narrowing the scope of what is going on. So I just push back against the title, not against the folks and the jobs that are doing this. I think they want them now and in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the final question to, to the two of you is um, whether uh, you think that uh, large data sources like NLP and unsupervised learning can be a help in, in gathering an overview of the field. So interconnections um, between various different uh, 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 learning components. So that could be analysis of large scale analysis of the, um, the learning, the learning uh, uh, prescriptions in universities or something like that. I think that would be really interesting to, to get the status now, but I'm not sure how helpful that will be to, to anticipate what will be needed in, in five years and what we have to plan now. So uh, mm -hmm. interesting, yes, to, to, to find predictions for the future needs. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. And um, so Simon had a question which addressed uh, uh, Martin and the description of the micro, I guess maybe both Martin and Aurel, uh, which was the description of, 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 of these micro credentials. And, and of course, uh, ECTS is very transferable, but the question was whether there was any process of trying to uh, make uh, it more formal, these uh, badges or proofs that can be taken more on an aggregate level. Are there any considerations of the certificates or diplomas acquiring a more uh, formal nature? I mean, for our certificate, not really yet. I mean, what we had in mind is to just give the students then a sheet of paper with all the logos on them. Uh, of, of the participating uh, academic institutions and then list, you know, what they have done within this program. We thought that would already be something for the students that is valuable um, and for future, like employers when when they apply somewhere. Um, but of course, we are thinking about this, yeah, how, how, how we could uh, make this more, formalize this a, a little bit more. Yeah? And this is difficult because every 
institution has different types of certificates, right? In Heidelberg, we have something that is called Certificate of Advanced Studies, or so, which um, we have, but then in, in other institutions is different. So, yeah, not we don't yet have a, a good solution for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, so what do you mean by micro credentials, uh, Jacob? The other question is whether it is whether there is a need for that or whether ECTS is um, yeah. enough. Yeah. So yeah. So probably ECTS is 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 already there, right? <laughs> it's made to be to be transferable in principle between in, within Europe, right? It's the idea behind it, I think. <laughs> and. Uh, and for us, this, this certificate thing was really to to motivate students and such that they feel part of like a program where they have certain requirements. And then uh, we thought this just keeps them going and taking several of our modules and yeah, feeling part of this of this uh, network also. Yeah. Yes. Um, but but I think in the end they are all they all are doing their masters, right? So. If we do something that is on top of their masters, um, the only thing we should ensure is that for the, the parts of this program that are really a lot of work, like extra courses, they should be able to accredit mm -hmm. these in their in the, in the master programs. Yeah. Yes. And, and, and internships, of course, as part of the master thesis projects. Um, but we haven't found a you know, formal solution that works more generally yeah um, Aurel, do you have a, did you have any considerations about this yeah 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 i mean i i, I have my personal opinion on this and um, so i believe that these micro credentials should be considered out on top of it or or um or let's say separately from 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 formal um master's education and um, in some sense addressing these uh, extra quantum skills that that an electrical engineer would 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 need, and um, and um, I'm not sure that formal accreditation is that important in this this respect. I believe what is important is quality assurance. So if there are multiple institutions in, involved, then this quality insurance uh, assurance has to be worked out. And um, otherwise, whether um, a certificate is recognized or not. That uh, I think is something that will um, that that the value of a certificate will be developing over time. So there has to have a ha has to be a certain tradition, and that will automatically um, 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 accredit basically give value a certain give value to this to the, to the um, certificate. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so Simon is, is saying that, 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 of course, the ECTS are made to be uh, transferable, um, uh, but, but then the question is whether there is uh, any, any extra um, the def difficulty in guaranteeing it. And uh, so, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, is there the quality insurance is, is, is important, but, but maybe can you comment on the need for anything beyond what is what do you see as the student needs for a diploma or for a micro credential, which is not just an ECTS? You are sorry. You, you, I think you should answer all that. <laughs> oh, I don't. Uh, I, I don't. I don't have the answer to this. I would. I would like to know what the answer to this. Mm -hmm. Um, um, I'm at an institution that has a full uh, quantum technology masters, so I'm not sure how we could use uh, micro credentials. But there is um, there is growing interest within the university, and uh, and I believe that with other faculties, it would be an interesting test ground to see how micro credentials uh, are viewed by the students and what to be done. But the quality assurance and to make it. Having just a micro credential, university by university, would probably be not the most efficient approach. So I think, especially now we're here with the the QT edu uh, community, I think we should do a joint effort 
to to define these standards and create something that uh, that can then be applied across Europe or as uh, as as far as possible. Yes. So so what 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 Simon just said that. Uh, the value of micro credentials depends totally on the recognition from the students' perspective. This is also what we experienced, right? So in our welcome meeting, the, all, all the questions were centered around, does that count for, for my master's study? Yeah. And, and also, yeah, what, what are the requirements for your, your certificate? Like, yeah, they just want this certificate, like, because it's something they can show. Yeah. And then this is, how students are thinking a lot, yeah. <laughs> and I agree. It's, it's understandable because the masters, uh, they require a lot of work, right? <laughs> and to do something on top, you have to offer something yeah, that is somehow recognized. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much. Let me round off in the last couple of minutes here. Um, I wanted to at least make sure that I had mentioned, uh, I had a couple of slides, but I dare not show them because then I get kicked off again. Uh, but uh, there is, uh, as many of you know and have heard about, uh, a call coming out uh, now, which is uh, for master's education. There is 10 million euros per consortium, um, and there will be roughly seven of these consortia being uh, 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 awarded, probably. There was an information session today uh, uh, arranged by the commission, and there were 600 participants, and I had a small uh, snapshot from there which showed that only 2% of the participants were from quantum. So there's going to be very much competition from, from fields like AI and data science. But on the other hand, with the community, we also have a lot of uh, uh, establishments now that we see from all of the three different pilots. And, and uh, what we are going to be pursuing is to see whether we can find a way of having consortia that will benefit the entire community in the way that we can build, have masters uh, masters giving organizations but then also have layers around them of, of uh, maybe even content providers or internship providers and that we can build common resources within a consortium like that that is going to benefit the entire community so those are some of the considerations which are cu currently going on but 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 from from the um, information session today the, the the answer was there's a lot of in, there's a lot of interest in it in, in in other fields so there are going to be a lot of uh, of calls coming in from all these different fields and 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 our hope can be that we can that we can put together one or two calls that that uh, that really uh, that really build off of the all of the good initiatives that we have uh, in the coming time now in addition to that there will be um, a, a session tomorrow about uh, about the industry uh, aspects and in the industry pilot, and we will be rounding it off. There will also in the afternoon be a session um, with um, a, a panel session with discussion, more general discussions about challenges in quantum education. So I would like to thank all of the speakers uh, now and all of the participants um, and wish you a good evening and then see you all uh, tomorrow for more quantum education. Bye-bye.